Hello everyone and welcome back to Brooksburg Zoo. Yes, it is another Monday. Last week we finished our big, huge, amazing, stressful, yeah, building of the restaurant and the playground. I'm very, very, very happy with this whole area right here. To be fair, it is a little bit cramped right now over there at the side where the warthogs and the red river hogs are. And there is much going on in our restaurant. The fascinating thing is when you look at it, have you seen it? People enter on the right side and they leave on the left side. This is unintentionally and I don't know how this works, but uh, yeah. Seems like we have intelligent NPCs here in this game. <laughs> which is very great okay so uh, I really love the restaurant and the view from it and the view is only getting better when we are finished with today's episode because we are going to build right in this area right here and I promise you we are going to have something for the Lar Gibbons and for the Siamangs Siamangs, Siamangs, whatever you know what I mean and we're not going to have the Siamangs today, but we are going to build something for the Largibon. I also have to say I don't know yet if we are going to have something for the Siamang. But let's have a look at it at the end of the video, because right now I don't know where to put them. I usually thought we have something like an island habitat with two separate islands. You might know it from Arizona Adventure Park when you have seen my first English series here on YouTube, uh, which I started with the lemur islands, where I had three different islands for every lemur species that we had in the game. And I was thinking of building something similar for the gibbons and for the Siamang. But I did not know how to do it because I wanted to have something like an indoor area where you can see the si uh, the Simex and the Gibbons from the inside. Um, <laughs> no, that was so wrong. I don't want you to see those <laughs> those apes from the inside. I mean the inside habitat of the animals oh my god um, yeah <laughs> you know what I mean um, I wanted to have an indoor habitat as uh, uh, okay right now I have to think very very carefully of the words that I'm choosing I wanted to have an indoor habitat for both of the animals and an indoor habitat that our visitors actually can look into so this was the right wording um, yeah and putting down the indoor habitat I was thinking of having one on this side of the path and one on the opposite side of the path and connect them through their roof so that actually it is like you are going uh, as a visitor under uh, yeah through a tunnel um, or something like that yeah or a bridge or whatever so uh, that you walk through the roof <coughs> and have the gibbons on the left side and the siamangs on the right side but then I noticed that this wouldn't work because of the terrain that we have in here uh, as you might remember in the second to last episode where we built the outdoor habitat for our pygmy hippos we lowered down the terrain a little bit so that we can have an underwater viewing area so we had to lower down the whole terrain here and that caused some problems because you know the thing with the water level here in planet zoo um, so you can't have water in yeah on every inch that uh, that you want to have or that you need to have for your habitat but it is only like um, not every meter but every half meter I think you can uh, you can have the water level 
so by lowering down the terrain um, caused the problem that if I lowered it down again on the level that we have it right now I hope this makes sense when you listen to the, uh, to this because this sounds a little bit weird to me right now. Uh, when you lower the terrain right now, the water would be in a very weird level. So I had to elevate the terrain once again on the level that it is right now and um, to come back to the beginning of what I, wa uh, what I was trying to say is I could not place the building at this place where it stands right now because it just wouldn't have worked with the water level so I had to change that you will see it in a few minutes and uh, so right now I just don't know where to put the Xiaomang and if I should put the Xiaomang in this suit you can let me know in the comment section and uh, tell me if you want to see the Siamang or if you have any idea where I can put those. Um, just wait till the end of the video when you comment on this. Then you will see how the whole habitat looks and where it is right now, how much space is, uh, is left and uh, you will also see that in the real time part because we do have left a little space on the opposite side of the pygmy hippo habitat and on the opposite side of where this gibbon house is uh, standing in the end. And we also do have a small place uh, left open between the given habitat and our Brooksburg barn restaurant. So that is also an option. I don't know if it would be enough space for the Siaming. Maybe for a different animal. I just don't know what animal, but I, yeah, I really would love at least to have uh, some kind of animal. Maybe some hoofstock or something like that uh, right between the Gibbon habitat and the restaurant because I think this would make such a beautiful viewpoint from the restaurant. Um, yeah, just let me know what you think about it. If you have any ideas for me, uh, if you could help me out with finding the right place for the Siaming, and yeah, I would be very glad for that. So, as you can see, the ground structure for our building is almost ready. We're just laying down some floors for our staff area here. It is going to be a very small staff area because I thought we don't need that much space in here because we only have the gibbons in here and uh, we just need some place for our staff where they can prepare the food for the animals. Uh, the food and where they can have uh, some of their material for cleaning the habitat. Yeah, inspiration for this was a little bit, uh, at least for the staff area, uh, the zoo in Munich. Um, they have a house for small apes. Um, where also some uh, some Siamangs live in there. They do also have this huge wall with the chain link uh, where you can see in the habitat and uh, the uh, yeah the keepers uh, area is right behind that chain link wall. Yeah, I was uh, I was really going for it in this episode uh, in this build because I try to do something different. I try to do some uh, electrician work. So I used those cable pieces and those, co uh, those connection pieces as well as this switch here where you actually could push the switch so that the gates for uh, the apes would open or close. So that is a first for me and I'm really proud, uh, proud of it. I don't know if it makes totally sense because I think it would be a little bit difficult, especially for uh, Gibbons and uh, Siamang if you have the cable as this open in the indoor habitat because I think those uh, Gibbons would, uh, yeah, would throw it from the wall. So it would be a little bit uh, dangerous for, uh, for the apes at least. Yeah, so a little bit of uh, stuff pieces 
staff pieces, staff pieces uh, for our staff area. Uh, nothing very special, nothing very new that you haven't seen already in my builds. Uh, the only thing that I tried anew or that I did anew is I was going to build a table with those metal pieces right here and uh, also you you most of the times you would see in those uh, kitchens uh, for where the food for the animal is being prepared that those tables are very uh, yeah metallic and uh, just for for um, hygiene hygiene Hy hygienical reasons Oh my god, this is a very difficult word to talk, uh, to pronounce. Um, reading it is not that difficult, but pronouncing it is uh, pretty, yeah. Okay, you know what I mean? Um, for reasons of cleanliness, let's say it like this. Yeah, that's what I did in here. Uh, also put down some... Um, yeah, some working materials for our staff members and I thought it would be a nice idea to hang those gibbon wall pieces on the wall especially where the cable is hanging so that it actually looks like the gibbon is uh, swinging on uh, that cable piece. I hope he doesn't for real when uh, once uh, those animals are in there. Um, yeah, haven't seen it yet, hoping that they won't do it but you never know. Okay, last finishing touches in the staff area and then we are going to continue to decorate the indoor habitat with some climbing pieces. Yeah, and here I was starting with some of those dead tree pieces because I've seen something on pictures uh, that I googled for those indoor habitats for uh, the gibbons where they had something similar in there connected with some rope pieces and uh, wooden beams and stuff like that and I wanted to create something very similar to this. Um, Usually I don't take that much time in creating climbing frames because that is something I said it in the last episode by building restaurants. I hate building restaurants. No, I, I don't hate it. I, I just don't like it and this goes as well for climbing frames for, uh, for animals. But this time I was very very excited for it because I think gibbons and uh, cymax as well are such unique animals and such gorgeous animals and they use those climbing pieces in such a unique uh, form. Uh, so I was very excited to build something for them that they actually would and could use to the fullest and uh, so I took my time not just for the indoor habitat in here but especially for the outdoor habitat what uh, where we are going to get into in a few minutes let me tell you the whole climbing frames for uh, for the outdoor section took me about three two or three hours so this is a lot uh, because usually when I build something like uh, climbing pieces for the animals it just takes me a few minutes because I'm I don't yeah I don't get that much into it yeah I also had to take care of here um, of the path for the keeper because you know you uh, we have the keeper gate in here so the keeper enters this indoor habitat um, through the staff area and uh, then uh, enters the indoor habitat and he can only go outside into the outdoor habitat through the gate that we built in here so we had to make sure that the way to the gate and through the gate would be not occupied by anything. 
uh, that was a little bit of a problem because I had to get into it after the animals were in here and I noticed that our keepers couldn't go anywhere so they couldn't go outside and fill up those uh, food enrichment uh, food enrichments for the animals uh, they couldn't clean the habitat they couldn't do a thing so uh, I had to yeah to relocate some of the climbing structures just a tiny little bit I didn't have to make that huge changes in here uh, fortunately I'm very grateful for that and uh, yeah and uh, yeah I, I fixed it I fixed it in the end and what I'm uh, yeah what I'm always am happy about very very much is in the end of the build when the animals are going to get into the habitat and they can use everything everything works out just fine for them that is that is the best part of all of it because you know some of you guys uh, are when they are going to build something for the animals they are going to place at the habitat they release the animal into the habitat and then they are going to start building and uh, taking a look at it what do the animals need what do the animals want where can they go and uh, what do I have, what do I have to take care for this might be the easier way for some of you um, for me it is always easier to build something like I want it to be then release the animals and then have a look at it if everything works or if it doesn't um, sometimes that's a little bit stressful most of the times you know me most of the times it works out I have to do minor changes in the end uh, nothing nothing very special but most of the times I'm very very lucky and everything works out fine yeah, because I'm doing it like this. I built the whole habitat, built the whole nature, release the animals, take a look at the animals, crossing my fingers and hoping that everything would be okay. Yeah. In the end, the gibbons were, were very, very, very happy with everything they got from me. Uh, the habitat is twice more than twice as big as they would have needed it. Uh, in the beginning I was thinking about having a bigger habitat. I thought this would be quite small, but yeah, in the end the gibbons were more than happy with that. Yeah, but I also do have to be fair, uh, because lots of the habitat or some part of the habitat is not really reachable for the animals you will see what i mean with this uh, with this in the end of the video so here is what i was going to tell you uh, first of all you can now see where i did place the building for the gibbons and you know now what i mean when i say i don't know where to put the siamang um, because I want to have something like a round course in here so that the path actually would make sense for our visitors that they don't have to move double uh, or uh, having any dead ends or walking some path where they don't see everything in the zoo that is something that I hate uh, the most when I'm going into a zoo and um, trying to walk around and then noticing oh we have to take a turn here or we have to walk uh, walk back and uh, turn right instead of left uh, as we did before so that we can see everything so I always try to build something that would make sense and where you can walk through the whole zoo and uh, not going ways double or walking into some dead ends so uh, therefore I just don't know right now where to put the Siaming. Uh, I also avoid building habitats right uh, next to each other um, yeah on the left side on, uh, and on the right side of the path so if you say uh, why don't build something on the right side uh, directly opposite to the gibbons I don't think that would look great so I would like to avoid that so 
maybe we would have a chance to build it somewhere else maybe maybe on the lower left side of this building here so that we have a smaller habitat right across from the pygmy hippos for let's say the meerkat or something like that something something small something tiny um, yeah, I don't know the pangolin or I was going to say porcupine, but we don't have a porcupine yet. Um, yeah, something of the smaller animals and then right next to it uh, the Siamang. I just don't think that it would be a perfect match when we put the Siamang habitat uh, right between the Gibbon habitat uh, and uh, the Brooksburg barn. I just don't think that would that would look nice yeah but let's get back into what I'm doing right here uh, I wanted to have something like a viewing platform when you uh, where you can actually get a little bit closer to the animals so I built this wooden platform here um, making it uh, accessible for uh, for wheelchairs and for moms and dads with uh, with babies with strollers uh, so I built this ramp here as well so where you can go a little bit closer and ride over uh, the mold so that you can have a closer look at the animals uh, unfortunately it is not accessible for our visitors because it is only made of those wooden pieces we don't have a path that goes up there uh, with the path we would have a the problem when we have some elevated path we would have those uh, pieces sticking up on the sides of the path and I don't want that uh, so I decided not to have uh, an actual path going up there to the viewing platform yeah you might say we have the null path right now but uh, yeah you know the null path still has the problem that we have those elevated pieces sticking through it on the sides of it so the null path is also not an option here, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, and I wanted to say something about the fencing as well. As you can see, I used those little, little tiny fences here uh, for the visitors so that they don't step into the grass or closer to the animals or to the mold. Um, this is very much inspired or uh, yeah I even could say this is copied from uh, my home zoo in Munich because most of the barriers in Munich are like this. Uh, the zoo in Munich is um, well known for these uh, not not really invisible barriers but this um, more like psychological barriers because these uh, to be honest these barriers wouldn't hold any visitor back from jumping or walking into a habitat uh, where the animals are but it's something like a psychological barrier so you see there is a barrier and you don't step over it sometimes those kind of barriers also work for animals so um, especially when you have a habitat for a giraffe uh, for example and you have something like this this um, small fencing and also a dry mode where the giraffe actually wouldn't have a problem if uh, if it is panicking or if it is running to uh, to jump or uh, yeah just uh, just walk over uh, walk over that it works pretty well for some animals I have seen the most stunning barrier I think it was in uh, Krefeld Zoo in Germany for the Bactrian camels there I think it was uh, right at the beginning beginning of the zoo uh, there was no fencing at all for the habitat if I'm if I remember it correctly because it is uh, 
more than 10 years ago that I was there, um, there was no fencing at all for the camels. There was just a tiny moat between the visitors, between the guests and the camels. And it was so tiny it wouldn't have been a problem for me to just uh, jump over there and uh, be directly in the habitat for the camels. And you might also think it would not be any problem for the camels as well. But then there's this thing, camels can't jump. And so this was a barrier that works pretty fine for camels. Uh, yeah, they just can't get out there because they couldn't jump over this little tiny moat. Uh, yeah, sure, if they were running or something like that, like I said with the giraffe, if they were panicking, um, it maybe would be possible for them to escape. But uh, yeah, as I said, this was something that was uh, yeah quite stunning for me. Talking about barriers, um, we have this moat here filled with water for the gibbons. Uh, this works in this case perfectly fine because gibbons can swim. But that also does have a little bit of a disadvantage. Uh, because uh, gibbons can't swim, so if they accidentally fall into the water, they might drown. So this is something that happens uh, quite sometimes or happened quite sometimes uh, in some zoos. Uh, especially in Germany I heard of, uh, of those cases. We had a case in Munich where a chimpanzee um, had some kind of a fight and uh, ran away or uh, jumped accidentally into the water and was, uh, was drowning and um, found that later on. So um, that is something that many zoos don't do anymore when it comes to great apes or monkeys especially. Um, so they, they prefer to have glass barriers or dry modes or stuff like that, uh, higher glass walls and, uh, and something like that, so that those accidents don't happen anymore because, yeah, you know, this is very tragic. Um, and this is also why I put something like a stair in here for uh, yeah for the moat. So if a gibbon would accidentally jump or fall into the water, so that he actually could climb out of the water on the side of the habitat and climb back into the habitat. So this would help very much. Um, yeah, that is also something, if you have something like a moat filled with water for any kind of animal, it would, uh, it would always be perfect or uh, necessary, not perfect, it would be necessary to have something like, uh, like a ramp or uh, something like that, where the animals actually could go back into the habitat when they ex uh, accidentally jump or fall into the water. I just saw a video a few weeks ago where a black buck uh, fell into uh, um, a moat in a habitat that was shared with uh, with Asian elephants and the Asian elephant that was in the habitat with the black buck uh, tried to help the black buck and get him out of the water but couldn't manage to do so. So the keeper went in and he jumped into the water and tried to get the black buck out. Um, in the end everything worked out and uh, the black buck could be rescued but yeah these are accidents that don't need to happen if you build habitats properly and think about stuff like that. So if there was something like a ramp or, uh, or something like that in there, this accident wouldn't have been that dramatic and uh, no one would have needed to rescue the black buck because the black buck could swim very easily and could go back to the ramp and up into his habitat. But without having such a thing, uh, yeah. 
such accidents could actually happen and sometimes they don't end up well for the animals. Yeah, so let's get back into this build here. Uh, the climbing structures are finished. Uh, what I wanted to do from the beginning on, I just didn't know how to manage it, was to have something like these towers that I built, uh, where the gibbons actually could leave their habitat. Um, uh, I usually wanted them to swing over the heads of the guests uh, over the path, but I decided no, this was just too much. I didn't want um, such very, very, very long rope pieces uh, to connect them with the climbing frames. This wouldn't have made much sense. And uh, so I decided to have two of these towers, one left and one right, to our viewing platform so that the apes uh, could climb over there and uh, yeah, they actually do that. Uh, I checked that out, you will see it in the end of the video as well. Um, they actually climb up there and uh, go through this viewing points and it is, uh, yeah, it looks, it looks pretty cool. Um, inspiration for that was Disney's Animal Kingdom where they have something very similar like that for the I don't know if it's Gibbons, as I've been there a few years ago, it was uh, Siamanx, so they were able to, yeah, to swing from their uh, habitat on, an, uh, on a little island right over the heads of the visitors uh, to these towers, which was an amazing, uh, amazing view. And so I wanted to have something like this, and that is why I built that and I'm very happy that the animals are actually using it and it works out. I also put down lots and lots and lots of plants because that is also something that you might see in gibbon habitats because uh, yeah, gibbons do not eat these plants so many of the habitats for them are a little bit overgrown and uh, yeah, that is something that I wanted to have. And I also used um, uh, these plants here for uh, the building to cover it up a little bit so that you don't have this prominent concrete pieces of the building stand out so much and to more blend into the whole greenery around here. Just a few finishing touches here to make it all a little bit more realistic and have the water always on the same level in here. And then we are ready for the real time part, I think. Yeah, and here we are. As you know, I updated the map once again. We do have the gibbons in here. Just find the right viewing point. Yeah, and let's go over and see some animals. Yeah, you can already see we have a lot of guests. Uh, as we do have the gibbons in here now, we do have a new favorite animal for our guests. The last favorite animal was the pygmy hippo, but now it is the gibbons. Yeah, we do have a lot, uh, yeah, massive problem with vandalism in here. Even though I do have security people, I do think we need to put some cameras down there. Here you can see I made some custom billboards once again. And now let's have a look at our animals. This is going to take a little time because I was so fascinated because these gibbons are such a great work that Francia did here. Uh, the animal models are just stunning and it is so much fun to watch them all the time. Here you can already see one of those gibbons uh, swinging over to the tower right here. Yeah, and then running back again. <laughs> it is so fun to watch these animals. Uh, I could do this the whole time. Okay, so I'm going to leave you alone with the gibbons. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you did so, you know what to do. Leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe to my channel and tune in next week when we are going to continue to build in Brooksburg Zoo. So thanks for watching. Bye guys!